At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Timothy L. Hall. He is the president of Mercy College in New York City. President Hall's priorities as president of Mercy College have been to increase enrollment at the college just four campuses and to promote greater student success. First time, full time, freshman retention has improved nearly 10% during Hall's first full academic year and transfer retention rates have improved by more than 5%. Since his arrival at Mercy, the college has been recognized by the White House as a bright spot in Hispanic education. Prior to arriving at Mercy, President Hall served for seven years as president of Austin Pay State University in Clarksville, Tennessee, which, under his leadership, was recognized as one of the great colleges to work for by the Chronicle of Higher Education. We are glad he accepted our invitation to share his experiences and insights with us today. Please help me welcome President Tim Hall. morning. Nice to see you all. I'm glad to be back into the country where it's all right to say y'all. <laughs> I grew up in Texas and spent many years in Mississippi and Tennessee before finally landing in New York. Uh, since I'm a southerner, I've just engaged in the equivalent of the taking off of the watch. I grew up watching politicians and preachers. You know about the tradition of the taking off of the watch is that I, I take it off and I put it over here and I pay no further attention to it. <laughs> I wish you would think with me about uh, what it would be like to be one of uh, Copernicus's close friends invited to his house for dinner one evening, sometime around 1543, before the publication of his, his book on the evolutions of the heavenly spheres. You all remember that Copernicus is famous for having uh, introduced a revolutionary idea into the world. And the revolutionary idea was the idea that the, the cosmos, rather than geocentric, was actually heliocentric. That instead of the Earth sitting at the very center of the cosmos, he produced the revolutionary idea that it was the sun that sat at the center and the earth and other planets rotated around it. And imagine that you go into his house and he, he's explained that, that idea to you and what you would be thinking with your companions as you left for the evening and headed back home after a nice dinner and some conversation and maybe a little wine. And you thought, I, I'm pretty sure you would think, you think about that revolutionary idea and whether it were true or whether it were not and what supported it and what did not. But I think you'd ultimately come around also to thinking another thought and that is, I wonder what difference that revolutionary idea will have on the way we think about all sorts of things. Because that's the capacity of a revolutionary idea. It is to generate other ideas. And so I think if we'd been walking home that evening, we'd be thinking, okay, what does locating the sun at the center of the cosmos, what does that do about the way we think about all sorts of things? I promise you when he produced this idea, lots of people thought about its consequences for other ideas. There were, there were thoughts about the theological consequences of that revolutionary idea. There ultimately became scientific thoughts about the consequence of putting the sun at the very center in terms of generating other ideas. We are at, I think, the sort of tail end of what I'll refer to as a revolution in the area of student success that took place along similar, uh, along similar lines. The fundamental thing that's happened across a generation is that we have replaced one central figure or idea with another central figure or idea in American higher education education. 
the idea that we have replaced that, that dominated for centuries was the notion that at the center of higher education was the professor teaching. It, so if you wanted to publish a book about higher education, you wanted an emblem or picture or some artistic rendering that would express the very center of higher education, you would probably, what would come to your mind is, well, it is, is, it is this professor who stands up and professes, who stands up and communicates with students. That's, that's the very heart of higher education, the very center of it. But over the last generation, something has happened where we have migrated from that idea to another idea about where the center is. And now, today, if you ask accrediting bodies, if you ask governmental bodies, if you ask our colleagues generally, we understand that there is a new center. And that new center is probably going to produce some new ideas. The new center is, it is instead of the professor teaching, we envision the center being the student learning the student persisting, the student graduating, the student thriving, that that now is, if you look at accreditation practices, if you look at assessment practices, if you look at conversations that are going on at state levels or federal level, everybody is not so much focused on whether the professor teaching is doing a good job or whether that's all working right. Now people tend to run immediately to a different question and that is, are students, are students learning? Are they persisting? Are they graduating? Are they thriving? Because they're the center thing. The professor teaching is a way to get to the real center, but it is not the center. This is, I, I can't emphasize enough how fundamental a change this is in the way we think and what power it has to generate other ways of thinking. Where did it come from? I mean, how, do we, how did we make that evolution in thought? I think the first thing that happened is on the basis of research that, that extends back into the early part of the 20th century, but really uh, began to have purchase on the way we envisioned higher education in the 70s and 80s, is we came to the conclusion that it is possible for institutions of higher education to make a difference in students. That it's not simply the case that we, using the professor teaching, uh, speak to whatever students who happen to come our way, and if they have the capacity to get what it is that we're offering, then they'll get it. If they don't, uh, that's, that's a shame, but they'll go on their way and we'll get some more students who will be able to get what we're delivering. Instead of that, we suddenly have discovered on the basis of empirical evidence that it's possible to make a difference, that it's possible for one institution to have practices, have a culture that produce more learning than another institution. Now, we all knew this, right? I mean, we've had good teachers and not so good teachers. We always knew that a good teacher, a great professor, can make a difference over the merely, you know, modestly average professor. So we knew what it was to have somebody who really knows how to do it, what she would look like, how she would stand in front of a class, for example. We knew that it was possible for that professor to make a difference. But we, we had a whole way of thinking that actually undermined what we knew and suggested that, well, if students go, don't get it, then there's not really much that we can do. I mean, all we can do is accept and try to work with the students who come to us. If they don't get it, that's too bad. But what we discovered about beginning in the 80s and accelerating on today, as you start looking around the country to see models of learning, models of retention and persistence in graduation, is it's possible for different institutions, it's possible for different individuals, it's possible for different professors, it's possible for different administrators, different staff members, to make a real difference in the lives of students. So once we discovered that it's possible to make a real difference, it was almost inevitable that uh, the world changed in ways where we understood that we needed to make this difference that was possible. The old idea that you could lose all sorts of students by attrition every year and you would be just exactly as well off as you were before is now viewed as utterly false. We know that when students leave, we suffer the loss as higher education institutions. When they don't thrive, we suffer the loss. This wasn't so apparent a generation ago where we thought, well, that's just so-so, it doesn't really matter us. But it now we know that having the capacity to make a difference follows immediately to the next thought of it is we need to make that difference. 
our funding, you know, presidents always think about funding, legislators think about funding. They realize that students who don't succeed, students who don't succeed, students who don't graduate and end up out there in the world with lots of college debt and only a few college credits, that hurts us all. It's not simply a private loss that occurs, it is a public, it is a communal loss that we experience when students fail to achieve the goals of higher education. And so now you're perceiving, I know in North Carolina, as in virtually every state and in the country as a whole, political figures constantly are thinking, what are you doing? I mean, we now have been told that it's possible for colleges and universities to make a difference. Exactly what difference are you making? Are you making any difference in the lives of your students? Or are you just taking the ones who come to you and sort of churn them back out in roughly the same form as in which they came to you? That is now intolerable in most environments. And if you are a president, if you even are a faculty member, if you're a staff member, an administrator, you have that way of thinking. It doesn't really matter. You're probably not headed towards success in the modern context. Because now, as a result of the student success revolution, we know it's possible to make a difference, and we know we need to make the difference. That combines to produce what I'll call the student success imperative. I, I'm sad to say that there's still large segments of higher education who haven't caught up with this thinking, that don't understand that there are places that are making a real difference because they are doing different things and they are seeing students succeed in ways that their peers sometimes are not because they are making that difference. But I promise you, everybody looking in, into higher education today knows that that difference is possible to make, and they're expecting more and more institutions, individuals, leaders to make such a difference. I've been hired now as a president twice. I, I began my career as a law professor at the University of Mississippi, became involved in undergraduate education along the way, a curious thing for a law professor to do, eventually became a, an associate provost uh, at the University of Mississippi, and, and now two stints as a president. I promise you, I've worked with system heads, and I now work with a private board. They know that making a difference is possible, and that's what they expect. I'll help to cause our communities to do because they can see around the country that differences are being made. Here's our challenge. Some places more of a challenge than others, but if you talk about American higher education all together, you have to talk about this challenge. And that is, we are being defeated by demography. We're being defeated by demography. We should be saying this all the time, and we rarely say it enough, but it is absolutely the truth. Why is it the truth? So just look. I could give you all sorts of graphs and statistics to illustrate the truth of this, this one point. Here's just one. If you look at scores, say an SAT score, that are a rough measurement possibly of what students are capable of doing upon their exit from high school, what you'll discover is there is a radical difference between how that score relates to college graduation, even for people in the same range. So people that you would think based on that score have similar kinds of intellectual abilities, what you'll discover is there are real difference in how people from different economic backgrounds will likely be able to use those intellectual abilities to, say, graduate from college. And so you can see the gap is about 40%. Whether you're talking about the range of SAT scores at the bottom or you're talking about the range of SAT scores at the top, the gap is about 40%. And here's the startling truth. That gap is getting bigger. It is bigger today than it was a generation ago. So we have, for a generation, been doing things related to the topic of student success. We have been, you know, we have our learning communities. We have our first year orientation programs. We have our uh, early alert systems, which try to catch students as they're getting off track as soon as possible. This has been going on for a generation. What has it produced? It's produced a broader gap today than existed a generation ago. That most of, these, most of these strategies are working. We are seeing increased persistence across the board, but the persistence is widening based upon family income. So Tom Mortensen of Post-Secondary opp Opportunities describes it like this. The data suggests that if you are a high school student with a C average, but you're from the top 
quintile of family incomes, it's better than 80% likely that you'll go on and get a college degree. If on the other hand, you are a high school student with an A average, but you are from the bottom quintile of family incomes, you're less than 10% likely ever to graduate from college. Here's another way of looking at it. If you just look at institutions across the country, aggregate the information about who is serving the students who are coming predominantly from lower income family backgrounds, and who's serving students predominantly not from those backgrounds, you will see that there is an almost chain-like correlation between the uh, graduation rate, six-year graduation rate. So if you're an institution that has 80% or more students who are Pell eligible, the chances of your graduation rate being anything other than about 20% are very, very low. If on the other hand, you serve very few of those students, then your graduation rate is very likely to be up 80% or better. In America today, America of the 21st century, the key to graduation, according to this data, appears not to be merit, but money. Not merit but money. This is the thought I wake up every day thinking because 70% of the freshmen who attend Mercy College are Pell eligible. We are a minority serving institution with roughly 35% of our students are Latino and another 30 some odd percent are black and another 30% are something other. But most of them are coming from families in the lower quartile of family incomes. And so according to this chart, we should expect to see results that are not at all happy. We should expect to see students accumulating a lot of debt but not actually making it through college and graduating. What are our choices? Uh, the choice that some people make is simply to accept this state of affairs. So there are plenty of folks, and I hear them talk, so I know what they're doing when they say, well, what are we going to do? I have listening meetings with every division of our staff, with our students, and with every one of our academic disciplines. So I hear faculty say this, that what are we going to do? They're coming from poor backgrounds, so their chances are not very good. There are a fair number of folks in higher education who simply accept the demography of money as opposed to merit. There are other people who are trying to avoid demography. The way you avoid demography is just put your standards in such a place as you are not likely to get students from those backgrounds. It's, it's easy to do. And so you won't have to deal with that particular problem. I think there is a better option that America is not nearly enough focused on, and that is to defeat demography, to say those numbers aren't acceptable in 21st century America. I don't know how we can even imagine a future in which these numbers prevail, but we're headed in that direction unless some institutions, some individuals make a difference in this regard. You'll talk, I'm sure today, about some of the possibilities, some of the ways you can be a coordinated community of care. I want to talk more about the thinking behind how you get to that place. Because just like Copernicus introduced a revolutionary thought that it was the sun, Helios, at the center of the cosmos, and that thought has the power to generate other thoughts, I suggest to you that the revolutionary thought that it is the student learning and persisting and graduating and thriving that ought to be at our center, that thought has the power to generate a whole host of other thoughts. But if you walk around the typical college campus and you try to listen to conversations, you will see that there are all sorts of assertions, of propositions being stated constantly that are actually in conflict with the revolutionary thought that it is the student learning, persisting, graduating, and thriving that is our center. So I'm going to talk with you a little bit about the way we think and what thoughts, it seems to me, are inconsistent with this revolutionary thought. So for example, it used to be the case that we really thought it did not matter to us if students made it. In fact, we thought if a healthy number of them don't flunk out, we must not be doing our job. We're not being rigorous enough. If too many students make it, it means you're soft on your grading. That's the way we thought. So a generation ago, when I started law school, I was just at the edge when law deans were stopping saying this 
but they were still saying it in plenty of places. They would say, look to your left, look to your right. One of those students is not going to be here at the end of the semester, and the law dean then would inevitably smile. That, that was in his, it was almost always a his at that time, in his mind, that was a happy thought that a third of the class would not make it because that happy thought meant that the faculty were being vigorous in their grading and we were being tough in our standards and so if students didn't make it, not any problem on our part and it actually is a benefit on our part because it shows that we're tough. Today, I promise you, you will not survive as a law school dean if you think like that. You won't survive as a president if you think very long like that because you will be eclipsed by the people who have understood that it really matters what happens to our students. That's not irrelevant. It's not just some charitable thought that we wish them well and maybe everything will turn out for them even though they don't possess the abilities to thrive in our environment. It is now a matter of self-preservation for institutions to care about what happens to students. And if you don't, you're on the way to extinction. This is always Professor Kingsfield in Paper Chase, you know, the guy who stands up front and uh, uh, is very demanding and very haughty. That was the model a generation ago of successful academics. It is not today, I promise you. Uh, if you were a law dean and a president ever heard you talking like that, you'd be out the door immediately because presidents and provosts understand generally that it's required that you understand what it takes to help students succeed. If you don't understand that, you're in the wrong job. That's the change that's happened. But it hasn't happened everywhere. There's still places where people, in spite of knowing that when you lose a third of your freshman class, that's dollars walking off the campus. Hello, it, it's money walking away when you lose those students. If it's possible for you to retain them, you will have resources to deal with other problems that you are constantly wishing you could deal with. And the reason some institutions don't is they let the third walk away without any thought that there were anything that they could do for them. But of course, there are things that can be done. And for any administrator in this world today not to know some of those things is it seems to me just craziness. We used to essentially spend a lot of time looking down on our students. Have you heard anybody say after some parent or some student has inquired about some question, heard them say, it's on the web, it's on the web, right? This is our condescending way of suggesting that all of the people outside of our community of very, very smart people are really pretty dumb if they can't find the things that we put up on the web so conveniently. How could we possibly think that way? I think part of it is because we think we've actually improved matters by putting everything on the web because there are at least some of us who remember the gym Right? Do you, anybody remember the gym? Right? You stand behind a table for an, an hour or two and you just hope it was the right table you were standing behind and they don't send you to another table and said, oh no, this is not the right table. You should be standing at that table over there. And we, some of us at least, remember that whole environment where registration was this day long process of standing behind table after table after table to get this and that done. And so we think, well, we have, we have defeated that kind of busy work because now everything is on the web. The only thing that we don't get so well is that when it was in the gym, the error costs were pretty low because by and large, when you got through that day, they wouldn't let you out of the gym till you had all of your business taken care of. And so it would be a long and arduous day of standing around but at the end of the day, you had it all pretty much done, and you didn't find yourself constantly visiting offices for the whole semester thereafter. But what's happened now is it's all on the web. I'm gonna give you some personal story. So I'm a president. I've been a president now for about 10 years. My, uh, my daughter attended as a student my last institution. Before she attended that institution, my son had gone away to a liberal arts college in Texas, Trinity, 
going to be university. And here's what I discovered. At the time, I was a mid-level academic administrator. At the time, my son was at Trinity University. I discovered that it seemed to be impossible for a fairly well-educated associate provost, who was also a law professor, to manage to deal with the financial aid system without calling up the financial aid office of Trinity University and saying, have I done it all? Is, is he set? I, I, I knew, I knew as an associate provost what it was like to have your schedule dumped out because you didn't pay everything and so they purged your record. I don't know if, if North Carolina does the purge. Lots of places do some form of purging, whereas if you haven't got all the I's dotted and the T's crossed by the time of registration, they'll just kick you out and you have to go back over again and try to get a class schedule again after you solved whatever deficit was going on. Um, I discovered every year, every year, I had to call the financial aid office at Trinity University to find out. A very fine institution, mind you, but I nevertheless, I couldn't do it on the web completely and be assured that it was taken care of. So when my daughter, now I'm a president at Austin P. State University in Tennessee. Austin P. is named for an early governor of Tennessee. Actually, the governor uh, of, at, of Tennessee during the Scopes trial was Austin P. And uh, so I'm president. And my daughter would come to my office so that she would log on to her account and then I would pull out a credit card to pay, to pay the fees. And so I would do it. There at my own university, I would do it. And then I would say, okay, honey, I can't tell whether we've actually really done it here. So why don't you run down to the bursar's office and ask them if you've done it. And then you can come back and I'll feel confident. Because I knew what purging was. I knew what it was like to have your schedule booted out. I knew how it frustrates everything we're doing to have all these schedules sort of thrown on the floor and have students have to recreate them at the last hour. But that's the way it's always been. And we seem to be still pretty content with thinking that if they can't get it, it means that the parents and the students must be deficit in some way. And we'll try to be tolerant of their lack of abilities here, but we really look down upon them. We really look down upon them. Here, I'll tell you this as a former lawyer and a law professor who's seen some complicated transactions and is aware of you know, what complicated business matters look like. So far as I can tell, the most complicated transaction most people will ever engage in is the transaction that they're getting financial aid for and admission into an institution of higher learning. It's easier to adopt a child. <laughs> you can set up a small corporation much more readily than you can get financial aid in most institutions. So there is not the slightest, not the slightest um, justification in our looking down on our students and our saying it's on the web along with the 30 billion other things that are on the web and expect that everybody's gonna be able to find our stuff. So let's talk a little bit about what does care look like if we don't look down upon our students and instead we, we look at them and we treat them with care, what does the care look like? Uh, you'll do more of this today as you thought. I thought I would touch upon a couple of ideas. One, I, I think it's a kind of twofold thing that one care looks like, especially coordinated care, looks like a system of processes, uh, a system of policies that support student learning, student persistence and graduation and thriving, that there have to be such processes at work. And over a generation, we've learned we've learned that there are processes that support student success. I'm a little bit more optimistic on this question than uh, Professor Black was. I actually think that there are models that suggest that the way we structure our affairs can make a large difference just by the structuring. There are places like Georgia State which are seeing enormous increases in student persistence and graduation, which are seeing a closing of racial gaps that frequently exist, and it's being predominantly through certain systems that are in place and certain practices in place. So I think we have to put a lot of emphasis on what those structures, what those services, what those processes are. There's not only processes that support uh, persistence, there are processes and services that support equity and justice, and, and that we have to 
include those in our thinking. And in fact, our problem is that too often we think like this. And this is a way of thinking, I think, that precedes the student success revolution, is we constantly are talking about, we constantly are writing about, commenting about whether students are ready for college or not. I, I'd be amazed if this, com if this campus isn't constantly talking about that subject. Because we know that students frequently are getting out of high school and they're not college ready for English, they're not college ready for math. Many institutions, this one less so because of the caliber of students that you attract, are uh, focused on what do we do with that problem. Because if we simply said we're not going to take any of the not college ready students, about two thirds or more of the institutions in the country would close down. So they're taking those students and the subject that they spend a lot of time talking about is what do you do with students who are not college ready. I think today more than ever we ought to talk more and more about what it means to be student ready, whether we are student ready. We make it as though all the readiness occurs on the student's part. When there is every indication that there is readiness on the college side, on the university side, and if we haven't set in place certain processes and systems and policy, if we haven't adopted a certain culture, then it's very likely that we're not student ready and we will lose students, not because of some defect on their part, but because of the defect on our part that we're not student ready, that we haven't prepared ourselves, right? So, we ought to spend a lot of time talking among ourselves, and since you've been doing this conference and doing other things, I, I assume you are talking about what those systems look like. And there are pretty standard ones all across the country that if you're not doing, you would be just crazy because they've been shown to have some significant impact on the likelihood that students will make it. Things like learning communities, things like building communities of students increase the stickiness of institutions. And so if you haven't tried to build communities of students, you're probably losing students just because you didn't do that one thing. Now today, institutions such as mine, which are, uh, we're trying to hold the line on tuition because we know the cost of education is one of the things that's affecting students' ability to finish education. So if you just let that thing run rampant every year, and I've been in places, I saw what happened after the Great Recession and after states withdrew their contribution to higher education to the tune of about a third of their support. This was the way it was in Tennessee. I saw what happened. Tuition starts rising every year and public tuition has been going up predominantly because states have retreated on their investment in higher education. I don't know what's happening in, in North Carolina, but in Tennessee I remember a relatively progressive Democratic governor uh, saying <coughs> after the recession, look, we're, we're decreasing what we're giving in support for higher education in Tennessee, but make sure the students don't feel this. Make sure they're not impacted by the fact that you lose 30% of your state appropriation. And I wanted to pick up the phone and call the governor's office and say, oh, okay, I will make sure that we shut down the amusement park and the day spa that are at the back of our campus. <laughs> so we, we, let, we let those places bear the loss of this state appropriation so that the class sizes stay the same and numbers of professors stay the same. Of course, that was nonsense. If you withdraw financial support, it means that classes will get bigger, adjunct numbers will get larger. That's just the way it works. And so that's what's been going on for about the last five or six years as states have been pulling back on their investments. So in addition to talking about those systems and structures, we also have to talk about the matter of culture. Is I think there is a real sense in which the systems and structures are generally not good enough. They won't, they won't do what we need them to do. That th it takes a certain kind of institutional heart to meet students where they are. And so I think you're talking today and I, I talk a lot about a culture of engagement, of connecting with our students of knowing them, of seeing them, of understanding and hearing them, that is the heart of student success in addition to the structures and the policies and the processes. You'll talk more today about what that looks like. I I'll talk a little bit about what it looks like as a president. 
uh, it seems to me that a president has a kind of unique ability, not because of anything, any merit or any particular ability on my part, but just because of the title. A president has the ability to show attention, to display respect, to say what you're doing is an important thing to be doing. Frequently, it's just by showing up. All I have to do is show up and smile and engage briefly, and people will say, okay, the president thinks what we're doing is important. Uh, I think it goes much further than presidents that everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants to be known and understood and heard. They don't want to be just someone in the crowd. Would you believe I went to a large urban university where my first history class had 500 students in it? So the professor who influenced me in enormous ways just because of what he said and how it captured my imagination. Nevertheless, he never spoke to me. He never even looked at me that I know because I was in a dark auditorium and he was lecturing to hundreds of students. And I compare that with the occasion of the people who in my past educational experiences looked at me and knew me for a second and said, here's a book you might be interested in reading or here's an opportunity I think you ought to pursue. Those people, and I have them in my whole past, they were crucial at every moment to every opportunity that came thereafter. And all the systems and processes that were in place, and there were many, even when I was coming up through uh, K through 12 and then college and graduate school and law school, all those systems did not match the effect upon my life of some people who knew me, who understood a little about who I was and where I was headed and what my dreams were. So I'm a huge believer just based on what happened to me and what I can see going on in higher education today that what campuses need in addition to those systems and processes are culture in which we care about our students, in which we know them. One of my favorite quotes comes from John Henry Newman who wrote who wrote this book, The Idea of a University. One of my favorite possessions is a copy of Newman's book that's signed by every faculty senate president who I worked with at my last institution because they heard how often I quoted from John Henry Newman who said this. We sometimes think that caring is this soft, fluffy, it's not, it's, it's not a very tough thing. John Henry Newman said more than a century ago, a university is an alma mater, a nursing, mother, knowing her children one by one, not a foundry or a mint or a treadmill. We've gotten so used to factory education that we don't even realize that there has always been, and it goes back a long way, a different model about what higher education looks like, a model that's much more personal, that's much more engaged with students, a, a model that is nothing like an assembly line. When I arrived at my uh, current university, I headed straight to the cafeteria the, my first day of work to see if there were any students. And it was in between semesters, so there weren't very many students. But there was one student there, and I sat, I sat in front of her. This is always kind of audacious, because I'm an introvert, and just sitting down in front of somebody I don't know is, is not easy for me. Uh, but I sat down in front of her, and we started talking. And I, te I said, tell me what you think is special about this place, Mercy College in, in New York. What do you think is special? I said, I'm not a number here, I'm not a number. We have relatively small class architecture, so we don't have large classes. Our main lecture hall holds about 120 students, and we rarely teach in it. Everything is geared towards the smaller classes, and that's geared towards being able to engage with students. Now, I'll tell you something that I used to tell to law students. I know that I put this thing down, but it's staying on exactly the same time that I put it down. I don't know what that's about. One of the things I used to tell law students when I was uh, a law professor is, it's not good enough to be competent. You need to look competent. I don't know if you've discovered that in your life, but there are people sometimes who have, who have the guts of the thing that's needed, but they don't present it very well. And in my experience, if a thing is not presented as well as existing in substance frequently, things don't work out. This is one of the areas. We might say that we're doing all sorts of things that care for students. And, and many institutions are. We have systems and processes and policies that are in place to support, to encourage, to, to try to make the path easier for students. 
But we just can't forget that frequently that's not enough. You have to look like you're caring. The care has to be visible. It has to be tangible. It has to be something that they can see or else they don't, they don't succeed in the same way as when they can see the care. So I hope you think about as you're going through your, your thoughts today and, and hereafter is how, how do we make care visible? How do we make care visible? Here's how a president does it is I'm constantly, even though I'm an introvert, trying to engage with students. If I don't go to the lunch hall and just sit down at a chair, sometimes I'll sit with a group of students if I, if I feel bold enough and talk with students as they come and go. It's a rare week for me because I know that a president trying to engage is one of the signs of caring. That's one of the signs. And if I don't do it, then that sign will be missing and whatever else we're doing may not be perceived. So for caring, uh, caring looks like to me that when some racist incident occurred last summer and my wife were, and I were away on vacation, uh, I immediately jump on Facebook and contact the president of our student government uh, and I talk to him. He's a black student. I say, how, how are you taking this? How, how are the people that you're connected with? How are you perceiving this? Caring seems to me for a president to me and that when all the stuff that was happening around the country in universities and colleges last year, that I pull together our, our groups of students of color and I say, all right, what is it like here for you? And I don't know that I got real answers from them. I, I don't know that they told me everything that was in their minds and in their, in their hearts, but I don't think there was a way that I could avoid doing that and pretend to be caring, not to ask the question, how is it going for you? How do you perceive this place? What should we be doing? What are we lacking here? Not to ask those kinds of questions seems to me to be saying I'm not really concerned. I'm concerned with doing things the way I've got it laid out, but I'm not really concerned with hearing from you and engaging from you. you. You can't be in higher education and know how frequently we think what seems to me to be a pre-revolutionary thought. And that is that the solution to virtually all of our problems is to go get some better students. That, that's it. If we just raise our standards, then things will be better for us. If we didn't have so many students who weren't college ready in English or math, if we didn't have students who had ESL difficulties, if we didn't have this or that kind of student and we could find the better, the magical student, then we'd all be much better. Th this is, I've sat in groups of presidents where they complain about the pressure about retention and graduation rates and I, I hear them say, we're just gonna have to raise our standards. We're, we're gonna have to get better students if we're gonna satisfy the governor's office and I want to say to them, there are other options. It's possible to get better for the students that you have. It's possible to make institutional improvements and changes that affect the students you have and allow them to perform more. You don't have to get better students. The people who say that we have to get better students in order to get better results, like retention and graduation rates, seem, they seem to me exactly like the student says, who says, uh, well, the only way I can figure out how to class pass this course is to cheat. That's, that's it. And right, when the student says that, you want to say, don't you? Uh, well, there are a few other options, <laughs> you know? You might devote a little more time to studying, a little bit more time in the academic support center. There are some other options besides cheating, same way for institutions. The institutions who say we can only affect our retention rates by getting better students are I, the only way I can say it is they are ill-informed about what's going on around the country where lots of people have discovered there are things that we can do that produce more success on the part of our students. We're constantly imagining the ball as in the student's court. And if only they would take care of their responsibilities, then we'd be able to do our job. Uh, so I love this scene from Kate and Leopold, a romantic movie about a guy who comes from the past into the present. Once he gets to the present, he meets this younger guy who has his eye upon a girl. And one night, the older guy has been kind of mentoring him about what he needs to do to get a date with the girl. And so the younger guy picks up the phone. They're walking the streets of New York, I guess, late at night. And the young guy calls the girl he's interested in and she's not there so he leaves her a message and then he hangs up and he turns triumphantly to the older guy and says, there, the ball's in her court. 
And the older guy looks at him and says, you don't want the ball to be in her court. You want the ball to be in your court. Because when the ball is in your court, you can do something. When the ball is in somebody else's court, you're powerless until it arrives to you. Higher education frequently takes on the, the garment of powerlessness by treating all problems as in somebody else's court. Now, I just promise you, Serena Williams, when the ball is in her court, she's enthusiastic because it means that somebody's about to get killed with a shot <laughs> that she makes, right? And she can't make the shot when the ball is not in her court, but when the ball is in her court, she brings to bear all of her talent and all of her ability, all of her energy and all of her heart, and she wins by dealing with the ball in her court. Higher education spends way too much time thinking about the ball in K through 12's court, or in the family's court, or in the culture's court. And th there's a sense, of course, where all of those things are impacting the students who come to us, but we can't generally do very much at all about those, those sources of influence on our students. And the more we spend talking, complaining about those sources of influence, the more we disempower ourselves because we're focused on the things that we cannot do. It's when we focus on the things we can do, when the ball is in our court, the policies, the practices, the kinds of personal engagement that you're talking about here today, that things can happen to change matters. So when, when we thought that it was the professor teaching at the very center of it, then colleges and universities used to be sort of locked into silos because we thought the performance was all about what we did. That was it, right? So it's what the professor did, it's what student affairs did, it's, it's all of that that really mattered. So if it's just what you do, you don't have to work with anybody else because it's just you. So you take care of what you're doing and you meet with your office and you, you coordinate with the people who work most closely to you and you don't have to think about anybody else because in that performance oriented way of thinking about higher education that was about our performance rather than our students learning what happened in their hearts and minds, working together wasn't important. But once you flip over to a different environment where we're focused on how we help support and encourage and care for students, then, then coordination takes on such a huge new part. Because without coordination, frequently, you can't put in place the systems and processes, and you can't have the culture that you need to really care for students. I promise you, when I was a teenager, I was, I was in love with Ralph Waldo Emerson. And this, this quotation was kind of like my personal motto. It's only as a man stands alone that I see him to be strong and to prevail. He is weaker by every recruit to his banner. Is not a man better than a town? And for a pretty introverted and shy teenager, those, those were bold words. Bold words, he's not a man better than a town. <laughs> as I've grown older, and especially as I've seen what, what communities can do, I have a whole lot more respect for towns. That there are things towns can do that individuals can't do just by themselves. That there are levels of coordination and cooperation and mutual support that we can provide that, that never kind of match up with what any one individual does. So now I'm a great supporter of communities and how they work together. At the institution I presently serve, our motto is the maverick, our, our uh, mascot is the maverick. And so I, I was hired because uh, our board wanted to see more success with our students. We are battling to defeat demography every day because of students who are coming from backgrounds that are rich in certain kinds of family and cultural resources, but not so rich when it comes to money. And money seems to be a huge factor when it comes to graduating from college. So we're trying to defeat demography where we are, and one of the things we're trying to do is put in place very quickly a series of processes and systems that have been shown around the country to produce better results. 
And so what this means is the president, and now we just hired a new provost, we sit down with a group of people every two weeks, and we work on these strategies and these processes and trying to get them implemented. What can we do? What can we do to multiply teaching excellence? We use a lot of adjuncts. That's one of the ways we hold down tuition. How are we certain that they're doing any good in the classroom? What, we can, what can we do to help ourselves be more certain of that? We are focused on things like personal mentoring. Every one of our students at the undergraduate level has a personal mentor who works with them. And that mentor, I don't know what it was like for you when you went to college. When I went to college, if I saw my faculty advisor twice a year, that was a remarkable year. Our personal mentors have in, a, in the freshman semester, the first semester, semester about 16 contacts, some of them face to face, some of them email, all of them, we're not talking about any blast kind of thing. We're talking about a personal, intentional communication between two people. We're seeing it when this was put in place about seven or eight years ago, we saw a 10 percentage point increase in retention immediately that has held ever since as we stop, start now moving up. We're working on redesigning courses to make them more places of active learning, less this sort of passive learning that gets people through exams but doesn't produce a lot of learning in the very end. And many students don't succeed well in that passive learning environment. We're working on choice architecture. How can we architect the choices our students have to make so that those choices are more likely to yield success? Not that we dictate choices, but we help to inform their choices and present them plausible paths that are more likely to produce success for them. How do we multiply high impact practices, undergraduate research, study abroad experiences, service learning? Because we know students who engage in those practices not only succeed better in the particular course in which those practices are embedded, but they become better students overall. So we're trying to multiply those practices. And then how do we see that our students find good career landings? That's what overwhelmingly they and their families are coming to us for. So we're trying to be more intentional about how we support those kinds of results on their part. If we were a generation ago, we'd be very satisfied about where we are right now. We'd say, we're tough, we're vigorous. We get the best students and it's because we're vigorous. Uh, I, I think we have lots of reason to suspect that that kind of thinking is already a sign that we're in trouble, that we're not where we should be. Thomas Edison said, Discontent is the first necessity of progress. Show me a truly satisfied man and I'll show you a failure. We're not discontent enough, in my opinion. We're too satisfied with what's going on, with the demographic results that are being borne out in our institutions across the country. One final thing I'll just mention to you. I'm not positive of this, but it's been something that, that uh, I've tried to replicate in the institutions I've been able to be a part of, and that is I suspect the way forward, because the way forward involves not only systems but cultures, not only policies and processes, but particular engagement at the level of students. Because the way forward is like that, I suspect that leadership and the way change occurs in an institution has to become less like top-down mandates that invariably produce institutional fatigue, where we say to ourselves, okay, what's the new president gonna think of this month? Because she'll think of something new next month, and so as long as we stall a little bit now, you know, next month we'll be ready to stall for the next new ad administrative action du jour. I think the way forward is for higher institutions to become more about collaborative and organic initiatives. Initiatives that don't start at a president's office but start in the heart of somebody who sees the potential to affect our students to the positive and who has a dream. I, I promise you now as a president, I am on the lookout constantly for those people. And those are the people that I want to steer money towards. Those are the people that I want to steer institutional clout toward is the people who have this vision, this passion, and they're prepared to go work without a stipend sometimes, work without some particular title because they have the heart for something that's going on. 
We inevitably talk about percentages at the administrative level because that's sort of how we chart what's happening in the hundreds and thousands of students' lives who come before us. I can sometimes get aggravated by the people who get aggravated by that talk and say, look, if you don't talk about this, I promise you, it's not likely that you'll do the sort of broad scale things that need to be done to affect the lives of students. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, it comes back to the fact that in my mind, there's a picture of four or five students among the many that I know, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, how is this going to affect Donovan? How is this going to affect Isabella? How is this going to affect each of those students that I know? That's the way, that's the way we think. And I keep one final thought in my mind, and that is, if you don't think about what demography is doing in this country for higher education, then you can go sleep, sleep well and you'll be satisfied with what's going on. But if you think hard about what's going, going on, as it really is, you'll, you'll be terrified. You'll, you'll say, how can America survive like this? So what's the antidote to that thinking, that self-satisfied thinking? I think it is something like Steve Jobs said, I love this phrase, I want to put a dean, and that's a, that's a little word, right? That's what it signifies, it's some little thing. It's like, oh, parents, I put a ding in the car. When I say ding, I'm trying to minimize what I did to the car, right? And Jobs uses that word, I think, in the same way, but he has a much better, bigger field of activity in mind. He wants to put the ding, not in some little thing over here, but he wants to put the ding in the universe. I think there is a place for people to put a ding in the universe of higher education that will help more of our students succeed, persist, and graduate and thrive. And that is work very, very worth doing. And I wish you success as you engage in it. Thank you.